Brothers and sisters, can all of you see Jeremy Chisholm? Can you see her? Who are you for for president? Jeremy Chisholm! We walked together down an important street. That street was Constitution Avenue. And only 27% of the 52% of the American people voted for our president. America has gone to sleep. Collective talents and abilities should be utilized by all of us in order to try and help make this world a better place in which to live. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was grooving. I was grooving to that because that is an amazing, amazing intro video. Um, big, big love to those who helped design that because that I think really gets at the heart of what we're talking about here this evening. I am the moderator and co-curator of the Unbought and Unbossed conversation series for this iteration of MBT at Home for this election season. Woo, we've got a lot to talk about. Um, so glad to have you here. Please feel free to drop some questions into the chat. We're gonna have some questions to ask you. If you have some questions to ask us, let's get this conversation started for real. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Chelsea D. This is Unbought and Unbossed, a conversation series for MBT at Home. Uh, so I would love to tell you a little bit about what this here thing is, what this series is about, um, and why it's in tandem with, a re with releases of a public service announcement commission series that is driven by Black women artists talking about the current issues that are facing us today and the urgency with which we should approach these things through art making. So that's a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about today, but I would love to open up the conversation in the chat just to get that going. Um, yes. So let me say a little bit about these conversations um, and a little bit about the commission series. So every Wednesday, coming at you Wednesday on MBT's Facebook page um, and Instagram page, there will be the release of a commission. We kicked it off um, last week with the release of Dane Figueroa's Edidi's Gut wrenching. I mean, it was a punch to the gut of truth and poetry and movement. It's a beautiful vi video installation. Check it out. Um, vi visit visit MBT's website. It's really, really beautiful. It's titled 1920, 2020, or Processing Anxiety Around Voting. I feel you, sis. So check out these releases. They're coming at you every week leading up to the election. There's gonna be a lot to talk about, a lot to think about. And this evening, we're gonna be speaking with a few of the artists who contributed to our commission series. Um, and we're gonna be speaking with Candace Hoyes in just a moment, um, who, who uh, in partnership with her creative partner, Val Jean T, released a commission yesterday. So we will be talking with them in a moment about that release as well. So without further ado, I would love to invite you all into out of the green room and into the conversation with Candace. Hi. Boys. <laughs> how are you? I'm fine. How are you, Chelsea? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, we were actually just talking before we went live. We were just talking about really encouraging people to type into the chat let's get let's get active um let's get some let's get some questions and things going um questions comments affirmations add them to the comment section below uh mia is doing an amazing job behind the scenes with our banners check hey, those mia. out they're scrolling <laughs> they've got some some dope information on them um but yeah actually a question i want to pose to the to the chat is what are some anxieties folks are processing around voting? Like, 
what questions do you have? What concerns do you have? I mean, Dane's piece really articulated some things that I'm I'm really struggling with. Uh, um, Candace, actually, to start us off, do you want to answer this question? I mean, what anxieties are you question. processing? Yes, and you know, I think it's important for us to um, really stretch out in this space. This is a space that we have created um, that. NBT has created for intimacy, for vulnerability, for candor and honesty. And um, in in all honesty, I'm I am anxious. I'm so mm-hmm. concerned for uh, Black voters. I'm um, especially concerned for Black voters. Uh, I think that we have a certain uh, weight upon us in the face of what I consider fascism mm. um name it that is that is uh it, it's it's really uh something i haven't experienced in the same way in my lifetime but i just want to start before i launch into my anxieties <laughs> i want to thank you <laughs> chelsea jonathan and Chade, you know nia all of you at national black theater for creating this series because I think if we can move art into our innermost space where we're allowed to rest and restore ourselves, it's a magical thing. And so I like this conversation. I hope that y'all do ask some questions because it will help us to direct it in a way that reflects all of us. It's not just, I don't you know, want to come on to uh, just reflect my own perspective, but really to learn from, from everyone. I've just been anxious, I think, about um, misinformation and and the way that it disaffects our community. I'm anxious about uh, the way that my daughter is looking at democracy and trying to calculate what she should hope for after the election and how long this is going to go on. I'm, of course, concerned about the way the pandemic is disaffecting the health and safety of the Black community and our first responders. so many nurses, so many uh, medical aides are women of color. Um, so I think that my concerns are multifaceted and my anxieties. And at these times, I'm grateful that I can express myself through art and that um, I've had the experience in my career to uh, find my way to a, a beautiful institution like National Black Theater, where I can make my art in community where I'm understood and affirmed. Yes, let's let's get into let's get into the overlap of art making and politics and and civic engagement. And what does it mean to be an an, an art maker at a time like this? Um, can you tell us a little bit about like your main art form? How would you how would you describe yourself as an artist? <laughs> I'd say I'm a multi genre. Um, artist, a music mm-hmm. artist at, at my core. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And I found that my self-definition has really unfolded or flowered as I mm. continued to work. I'm thinking about this interview that Donna Summer gave where she was talking about her career flowering. And so that mm. uh, video comes to my mind visually. Yeah. I have a visual memory of her talking about that. And yes. um, in the seventies and uh, the first time I saw her speaking in, in German. Did you know that oh. Donna Summer spoke German? I did not. I was today <laughs> today years old when I learned that. What? <laughs> so I find that I this is very relevant, although it seems like a I like magical associations. And they're <laughs> I mean they're often uh driven by my ar- archival research. I'm a historian yes. and an archival uh researcher. So when I was respectfully asked to join this group of women, I was delighted. Um, Not just because I can't wait to see what we're all gonna make and I love our shared conversation, but I do love to be able to take the um, history and legacy of Shirley Chisholm and make something new. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, it's funny, the, the memory I have of Donna Summer speaking German in the studio and talking about the direction, the future her imagination for her future is very mm-hmm. relevant actually to um, 
my view of the current political situation. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we're very defined by borders mm -hmm. and, and uh, a sense of citizenship, which is outmoded. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way to liberation mm -hmm. is to vote. And furthermore, it's to do so many other things like extending ourselves beyond the borders and the limitations where we're expected to be, the spaces we're expected to be, to find new languages. For me, it's musical language. And for her, it was music, German. I guess I speak, you know, in multiple contexts as well. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that, uh, you know, that that's a big part of like my inspiration is imagining uh, a liberated black future. And that's what mm. I guess shapes if, whether I'm producing, I'm singing, I'm composing, I'm writing, or I'm in collaboration with other artists, I'd say that characterizes my style. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's just, oh, there's just so much there's so much in what you just said about magical associ I'm I'm making I feel like some magical associations and I'm Share trying to like <laughs> quickly what to mind? <laughs> make, make sense. What um, to mind? But you know, first of all, this 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 definition of citizenship that you said is outmoded. Like that's not even how we define ourselves anymore. And then to to use our imaginations to envision um, a liberated black future, I mean, is really at the base of why the creative team at MBT wanted to have these conversation series, wanted to have this commission series, wanted to partner with, um, wanted to partner to create 100 Years, 100 Women. That was so much a part of this conversation of how are we defining citizenship? How are we asserting our citizenship? I think about Shirley Chisholm's run for president is a, a really an assertion of her citizenship. It wasn't you know, just one huge gimmick, even though it may have been perceived as such. It is someone saying, I'm a part of this and I'm going to contribute. Um, and something that we that's in the, the intro video for this series is a little clip of her saying, we need to use everyone's talents. We need to use, there has to be um, a contribution from everyone in order for us to build this liberated future. So uh, everything that you're talking about and, and thinking about, I feel like is at the root of why it was so important for us to have this conversation series now, particularly at this point in, in our democracy. And you mentioned fascism, which has been, really been at the forefront of my mind because I'm thinking about the designation of Antifa as a domestic terror organization and like how are we defining words and movements and ideas, you know, in a way that is not outmoded? How are we how are we plugging into what people are feeling and needing today in this in this moment? And how can we be of service and of use to that? So I mean, you and you I think you you actually you might be able to answer this. Do you see like throughout you you've studied black women's political activism throughout American history and just just black women being drivers of political movements throughout American history? Um, where do you see the black artists, the black woman artists in that trajectory, like in these cycles of time? Where 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 do we fit in? I mean, I mean it's huge. It's a beautiful question. <laughs> I love a huge question. We 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 encompass that though. We can we can hold that that yeah. of a question. It's a wonderful question. I think there's, we ask, we're looking at the, we're asking the fearless questions. Um, yeah. We are not afraid if we don't have a compact, uh, minute answer or a finite answer. So where do I see art? I think that there is a mm, innate, in inborn, uh expression uh that that is can be used uh the voice is the first well i'd start i'd say this the voice is the first instrument uh -huh. and that's what i was describing i was trying to describe how i see the voice and of course i'm partial to the voice because that's my primary instrument but i use my voice as long as i've used my voice to sing i've used my voice to protest hmm. and i I think because the voice is the the first uh, the very first instrument, everything else is outside of you, and maybe the drum or so is next. I don't. I would say so. 
Um, which is why Val and I love to make music. I think there is something that is fundamental that we tap into and spiritual. Um, Chelsea, did you want me to speak to, you said, where do I feel it fits into this long history of resistance artistry? Mm -hmm. yeah, artistry. I, think that, mm -hmm. I think that uh, Sojourner Truth mm, as, yeah. as a public speaker and her extraordinary rhetorical and philosophical, spiritual, political gifts. Uh, I think the very um, ability uh, and tradition of storytelling and rich folkloric um, storytelling that descended uh, from, you know, nations and, 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 and communities in Africa and, and through the Middle Passage to the United States and was elaborated. I think of field songs, I think of work songs, I think of spirituals and I get, I'm bodily affected. I'm in goosebumps when I, when I let my spirit fly to those, those recollections of, of uh, stories I've experienced now, but you know, um, obviously it's, it harkens to a, a time I wasn't here on the earth, but mm -hmm. I think I, I always keep it there. I think there, um, someone was, I was in this group yesterday, a Facebook group of opera singers, oh. a mixed company uh, ethnically. And a teacher was asking, is it appropriate in, to keep it in a nutshell? She was asking, is it appropriate for me to encourage my white students to sing spirituals? and hmm. other songs just because they feel they're beautiful. And generally the opinion was, if it's a beautiful piece of art, you should encourage the student to take it up. Hmm. And I wasn't, that didn't sit well with me. Hmm. And I, I first posited that I, it is my mission to amplify um, histories that are, uh, have been suppressed and intentionally erased and that's part of my duty the way i see artistry but i think that more important oh there was also a reference to a black student who had objected to white students in the studio singing these works hmm. okay. and, and the teacher referenced that as well and i said you know rather than actually let's look at a different question rather than saying my black student raised an objection i said what are you doing to deepen the understanding of the work itself before you talk about who it belongs to and who can who can use it for different reasons to get through the discomfort of the protests over George Floyd or to get through the discomfort of being a teenager, Pro introduce the material, introduce the music with cultural context and history. Mm. Have you done that work before you start to quote a black student who it doesn't sound like you understood where she was coming from? because you're referencing her, it's not your own question. You're looking, you're asking me about the appearance of things. And I'm saying, we engage with music that has a historical and political context at the depth and level of our understanding of the historical and political context. Mm. So I, that's how, it's not about your complexion. Mm -hmm. man. <laughs> it's not about, it's about your understanding. It's about your understanding, yeah. yeah. Like it's why do you want to step to these spirituals? What are you trying to, it's, and, and we can't be um, as musicians, colleagues and educators and activists, we can't shy away from engaging with people about their level of understanding. You know, you're talking about uh, finding the language to label something terrorism or to label something mm -hmm. protest or legitimate or illegitimate. Understanding is the, is the basis for all of those those questions, and they don't have easy answers, like you said. But those are the those are the most productive questions, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I really love this. Um, I love this conversation about creating a context using history and using. You know, I've really been in a lot of conversations with other teaching artists and other arts organizations that are trying to figure out how to be as um, what is the word? There's like a special phrase they're using now, cultural, culturally competent or, That's cult it, it, okay. yeah, there, there, there's word, there's language <laughs> that we're New using. New language. 
new language, new language that we're giving to the idea of basically celebrating the excellence of communities of color and the histories of excellence within these communities. You know what I mean? Anyways, without so I do appreciate without appropriating, you yeah. know? And I mean, that's a really, I mean, America is good for a co-op. So I'm, I'm, it's like, how do you, it's a constant unearthing. It's a constant digging and constantly like recontextualizing things for folks. I also wanted to speak to something about um, the voice as an as an instrument uh, and and creativity and artistry, not just being reserved for people who have trained in in the art form itself, like that you can have a generative spirit, a creative spirit that is going to help propel you through moments, I think, of, of severe political anxiety. And I'm thinking of a specific story with Fannie Lou Hamer on her way to register voters with a group of, of folks and getting into a very tense moment and her singing and her song being what, you know, it just, this sound coming out of her soothing the entire bus and get, and getting them to a place of, of stability and and I think um, a reserve of strength that allowed for them to complete what they were what they were out there to do um, against immense opposition. Um, so yeah, I just want to throw that out there because that's a story that where I think like, oh my god, the voice. I'm gonna catch just, that then. If yeah. you throw that out, I'm gonna catch that and keep it right here because yeah. I left off when we were listing the songs. We were listening. We were tracing the the journey of, mm -hmm. of musical expression through our struggle. I think the mm -hmm. last thing I might've uttered was work songs. Yeah. And sis, you're picking up where I should have kept <laughs> talking was to say, you know, at, we are predominantly caretakers mm -hmm. to the end that, that, that is so much a part of uh, as black women, our history that we see mm -hmm. so many black and brown women disaffected by COVID right now, because of how much of that space we occupy. And I think the 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 music of the black church, mm -hmm. spirituals, music as worship, as testimony and bearing witness. Mm -hmm. And and the and the way that we express that also to the children we raise and the children we nurse and we care for, uh, to the extent that a lullaby, as you said, can soothe and appeal to the sensibilities of, of people in a different way than like a protest, a shouted protest. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, I mean, yes, it, there's so much like, um, we're so endlessly creative as black, so as black artists. So, and, and, I, I, and even just saying that, what you just said made me think of some of the chants I've heard at protests. Um, if, I, if, if I haven't been in physical attendance, I'll, you know, I do my doom scrolling. Yes. Doom scrolling on Twitter. <laughs> oh, is that what I do at night? I didn't know that was the word. See, the Thank language. The language. The language. <laughs> so it's it's a thing. Um, but I definitely have been have been hearing these chants or these like um, sometimes it's like a remix of a popular song. You're inserting these political um demands within the confines of like the newest popular song. Oh <laughs> Nia's Nia's got us with a with a with something with a banner down here. Doom scrolling. Doom scrolling. Scrolling through Twitter, reading all the bad news. I can't tell you. I think I have actually watched multiple uprisings in different cities in real time via Twitter and my doom scrolling on Twitter, just like tracking things as they happen. I mean and watching watching instances wind their way up through the media culture into the mainstream news you know, and just watching that process repeatedly. Oh, okay, anyways, doom scrolling. Thank you, Nia, for, defi <laughs> for defining for that. Me, for me, the doom scrolling sometimes is, I have so many friends who are, uh, who are artists and activists and writers and seeing people misrepresent what they say and just being so closely connected to the sacrifice involved in doing this this type of work mm -hmm. and bearing your personal story oftentimes to bear witness to injustice and seeing people you know 
manipulate and twist their words so that like sometimes that that's mm. the thing that can be like the hardest for me to. It's so yeah. interesting. Um, I mean, what you said just made me think about something magical association. I'm going to connect it to pleasure activism, but I'm going to put a pin in that for a quick second and talk about the the protest chance that, I mean, Toshi Reagan, when we were, our last Converse MBT at Home combo series, Toshi mentioned, you know, there's just so much creativity happening around the, the protest chants and that people are not necessarily singing work songs or spirituals as we would, we have come to think of protest music based on our understanding of the 60s and, and, and 50s and 70s, the protests that were happening then. But the things that are happening now, the, the, the slight raps, um, oh, oh, there's just there's like so much like rock music and metal music that people are like screaming mm -hmm. in the streets that I'm like, again, that's that Fannie Lou Hamer. That's that we are sonically engaging mm -hmm. in protest, you know, together collectively. And that it, it, that is all legitimate. Um, that's Mahalia Jackson singing Come Sunday at the March on Washington. That's Abby Lincoln and Max Roach recording We Insist. Marianne Anderson. I mean, so many. Harry so Belafonte. Many. Mm -hmm. Just sonic, sonic revolution is, is, a, is, a, is such a huge part of a part of this thing. You wonder singing Happy Birthday. There's um, many forms. I did not realize that that was a part of a larger campaign. That song was a part of a larger campaign. You know why you, a larger larger you, must thought, you must have thought, well, here I am <laughs> in my in my playlist and my Stevie Wonder playlist is, or your vinyls, you got all your vinyls, whatever your choice, your 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 delight is. And you think, oh, so many albums. When would he ever have time to launch a decades long campaign to make Dr. King's birthday a holiday? Like. I agree with you. I think, you know, we we have a great capacity and I think that we watch a debate like this week and it's soul, soul crushing and we feel uh, this confinement and this pressure at the same time, this overwhelm. And we're trying to keep our minds focused on strategy and be, uh, not just strategic, but encompassing many systems of oppression in our in our response and in our choices, you know, and in our yeah. questions. Because when you're getting these flood of lies and deceit and trickery, you really have to be so. It puts you in a state of wanting to ask very pointed and specific questions about, mm -hmm. um, you know how we're gonna accomplish this abolition and by what, you know, what strategy and what means. And I think that it's important when you're under that kind of confinement and pressure to remember that we are empowered and that we are the answer. We are the people we are looking for and waiting for. Yes. And and just to, to, to sustain that hope, the hope that was won by our ancestors, all those names that we just uttered, like since we started this call, we've called the name of like at least 20 ancestors who say that our vote matters mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and who you know helped us secure and sustain this vote. And, uh, you know, even now a lot of my anxiety, it, is coming from like the voter suppression and mm -hmm. the information about early voting. Yep. And uh, it really connects to the the same poll taxes and voter suppression. That came, yeah, they came after Reconstruction. I was like looking a lot about Ida B. Wells uh, mm. earlier this week because I would just wanted to look again at how she started organizing. I guess I was inspired by what we're all doing together at National Black Theater. Mm -hmm. Thinking about how she did manage to organize so many women uh, wow. to get the vote out uh, under mean, such a, you know, threat, life-threatening circumstances. I'm so glad you bring up Ida as well because this is the year, this is the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which right. MBT partnered with a, 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 a host of organizations to create the 100 Years 100 Women Project. Um, and something that was really amazing about 
speaking is realize that these women were on a decades long campaign against something that was so deeply rooted in the culture, which is it's laughable that that there could be feminine autonomy. Like, you know, that that's completely unnatural and un-American, right? How we can label things. So the decades long campaign to get the vote was sustained by art making, was sustained by people engaging, um, was sustained by folks like Ida B. Wells who were just so long visioning, you know what I mean? Editing papers, creating creating organizations, getting the word out. You talk about talk about using that voice. Talk about asserting your citizenship um, and the risks that are attendant with that. But I think I, I've been thinking a lot about suffragettes and how we're expanding our understanding of who the suffragettes were and who were who were these um, who were the political leaders. You know, Ida B. Wells just had a whole mosaic. Um, displayed of her at Union Station to celebrate the centennial. And her within this portrait of Ida B. Wells, there are just thousands of images of suffragettes. And you see the time it took for that campaign to, to pay off. And even, even now we see ourselves in a position where, I mean, you mentioned the essential work that Black women are doing that are putting us at, at, at higher um, risk of exposure to COVID-19 and thinking about, you know, gender, from a frame of gender, how women are placed in um, really close proximity to others because of the care work that we, that it's assumed that we are all better suited for, you know what I mean? Um, and how that is it, is, it is all trickling into something that is causing, the Washington Post just released an article yesterday about this recession being the most unequal in US history because of who it is impacting. And, and who it is impacting are those who got the vote in 1920, and here we find ourselves 100 years later, and 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 those gains are being severely threatened. So, mm -hmm. how are we sustaining? How do we sustain the campaign towards liberation? I think it's art. I also think it's pleasure. I also think I'm I'm starting to wonder. You know, hmm, maybe there's some information information that we can download from what brings us joy and what and what sustains our light and what sustains our our desire to stay alive, you know what I mean? Um, so I've been reading a lot of Audre Lorde recently, a lot of Adrian, Adrian uh, Marie, and really thinking about, well, how to sustain this? How, how, how can I work from a place of just infinite abundant reserves and resources? So Candace, my question to you um, is where are you finding joy? Where are you, oh, hi! Yeah. Hi, sorry I'm late. You're so right on time. The party. You're <laughs> right. You're <laughs> right on time. You are right on time because we were actually just about to talk about um, pleasure and joy and and sustaining sustaining um, the campaign towards liberation, the campaign towards our our freedom of being unbought and unbossed. Um, what is really generating the energy to do that? And so. My, can my question to Candace and maybe Shola, you can jump in, um, is what is this, what's giving you joy? What's bringing you pleasure? What, what are, what, what's, what's keeping you here, wanting to, to be present and, 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 and fight this fight? So I embed the joy and profound black imagination in any song that I write. Mm -hmm. And I it's it's because I just finished I just finished recording an album that I've mostly Ooh. written. Thank you. I, thank you. I'm uh I'm excited about it, but as I'm reflecting on how to describe it, it's mm. I realize that I being an archivist is very connected to my childhood sense of play and being a songwriter and a singer is all connected to a childhood sense of play. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned uh, that I've been able to capture best is that it continues to drive my creativity as an adult. And uh, on Black Women's Equal Pay Day, which was mm -hmm. August 13th, I put out yeah. a song, a new song called Zora's Moon, which mm -hmm. is inspired by Zora Neale Hurston 
and a story that she told on the radio in 1943 about um, running at night and feeling like the moon is following her, which is something mm. I always thought when I was a child, but I never would have thought it was something worthy of repeating on national radio. <laughs> and, the very, um, and it's a story that she, she, uh, she memorializes in dust tracks on a road. It's in the beginning mm. of it, but I had read it and I hadn't, to hear her tell it on the radio made me realize how, how wide the world is and how wide it was in 1943 and how wide it was when she was five or six running through Eatonville, Florida and saying, that's my moon. Mm -hmm. I took the archival sample and built the song around it. And so every time I, I've been talking about that song in the last few weeks since it came out, I have to tell people who Zora Neale Hurston is. A lot of them don't know. A lot mm. of them have not read her yet or and then that trip is where my joy is. I, I enjoy mm. sharing that. And I enjoy sharing, you know, my childhood memory of that. And it's all in the song. So I I make sure that all my work is um, enmeshed with my inherent joy and mm. like visioning, a, you know, the, I guess a, 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 a more, um, just vision of uh, of where I, I believe we're headed as black people. Mm. And so yeah. every time I every time I play, mm. that's what I'm tapping into. And it comes across in, in this project for me as well. It's that's what I want to uh, exude. Oh, beautiful. I love that you have you evoke the sense of play every time you play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shola, that was beautiful. Shola. So it's Shala, though. Uh, oh, Shala, like, like, yeah, Shala. like a soft O, like a shawl. Shala, like a shawl. Shala. 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 Shala, Shala. It's a Nigerian name. Uh, yeah. So sh my parents shortened it so Americans could say it. Um, but oh. you know, I really relate uh, to what both of you actually have been saying. You know, I mean, I think even in times of devastation to be able to find love and to Ooh. have um, imagination, um, you know, because that that is what Zora had. When you can't, when you don't have knowledge, but to have imagination to believe in mm. um, a future for yourself and the expansiveness of that, right? The moon is for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, for me, what I like to be able to do is, you know, having grown up in the 70s, free to be you and me, I felt I grew up very entitled. I had no <laughs> idea we weren't supposed to be entitled. Wow. And then I wondered, like, why history didn't reflect that? <laughs> huh. Yes, yes. And so... I like to take that Afrofuturistic lens and look back. Um, and to identify our foremothers and fathers um, who in their moment had a sense of imagination. So I call kind of the work you, you know, creating historical imagination. So it's anchored mm -hmm. in truth, right? It's anchored yeah. in truth. Um, and it allows us to reclaim the lost legacy um, and I, the lo our lost sense of selves through enslavement, right? Yeah, yeah. Our, it, it's our stories. It's who we are and where we come from. And so many of us can't tell our story, our, our family stories, right? Yeah. And then in terms of the broader culture, we're not fed with our sense of belonging, our, our, our thread in this great democratic, uh, great democracy, this experiment, right? You know? I mean, we leave grade school thinking, yeah, we were enslaved and we were pretty passive about it. <laughs> right. And then we marched nonviolently and got, you know. And Lincoln freed us. Exactly. <laughs> that, that literally history is written in a way where agency is given to someone else at every turn. Yes. You know, yes. even Martin Luther King, who was a complete activist, right, is, is hallmarked um, mm -hmm. as a dreamer. Yeah. It wasn't just passive dreaming. It was the the kind of dreaming that opens up your mind to um, 
and and forces action. And yeah. I think that if we can, yeah. So I that's love it. what I hold on to. Those are the stories I try and tell my children. It's like, what do you tell them? How do you explain what's going on? Black lives matter. Yes, that seems so obvious and yet it's not. And controversial. Right. It's, it's How controversial. is it controversial? But, it, you know, I, I mean, I could go on. I mean, it's controversial because when we got here, we were written into the Constitution mm. as less than. Mm. And it's our work. It's been our work to overcome it. Yeah. We, and, we, we, yeah. we intentionally chose a piece um, when Val and I were creating for this commission, um, we, we, we called, well, the name of our piece is stand up and be counted. And I'm Shala, you really like the perfect, uh, expert <laughs> on this topic. Of, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it, uh, we wanted to, uh, explore a speech that she gave in 74 with the experience of having run, um, you know, and and uh, we were very moved by the way she spoke about representation, actually. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Chelsea, you were asking me like about kind of fundamentally and historically, what do I think are like the moment of inception for where music activism, music and activism like kind of intersect. And I was telling mm -hmm. you, I think in the voice, the cry mm -hmm. of the voice, which can be music or protest. I think, uh, we found this one speech in 74 where uh, Representative Chisholm was talking about how uh, voting as an aspect and citizenship as an aspect of representation. And um, so what you're talking about, Shala, I think uh, really resonated with me as we were shaping this piece of, uh, there's always a sense that we're voting and I think we do vote because we there's been such an erasure of our, 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 our import and our um, all of the gains that we've made as Black people and also as, especially as Black women in mobilizing this nation, um, in making this a nation of women voting. And I think that is also why, like, even though I, I looked, I was, I've been very concerned like everyone else about how this, this election is going to go. Mm -hmm. I think it's like over 50 percent, maybe 55 percent. 55% of eligible black women voters voted in, in 2018. Mm -hmm. And we're such a reliable voting block and always have been. And yet it's That's huge. And yet mm -hmm. Breonna Taylor, and yet we struggle to even assert the language, much less the justice that we deserve in, in being feeling protected as citizens, mm -hmm. you know, even, even at rest. And I guess I'm ranging wildly too, widely, I should say. But um, yeah, I think that it's the, she was speaking about representation as like a fundamental aspect yes. of it. And it just hit this deep nerve for us. And that, so the piece came directly out of that part of the speech. Mm. I mean, and I would—I actually want to kind of start to dive into into the archives and how the archives are being used. And I also, Shala, could you just describe for folks who may not be familiar, like what is your main art form, um, and what's your connection to Shirley Chisholm? <laughs> just for folks out there who don't know. Sure, 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 sure. So I am. Uh, I guess a storyteller to a certain degree, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am best known as a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, having made a film about Shirley Chisholm and her run for president, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, I tracked her down, she was still around, so she tells the story. And I think that's an important mm -hmm. part, a component, right? Mm -hmm. Literally, it was like the 72 election, we don't think about Shirley Chisholm, but here was this woman who was the first black woman elected to Congress and she was running for the democratic ticket and she made it all the way to the convention. And history wrote about it as like a, um, as a publicity stunt when in fact, yeah. 
she had an incredibly smart strategy and she understood what power was in the context. In other words, delegate votes and how you would get to the convention and you would bargain with delegates, not just like, oh, do the right thing, support women's rights, support black rights, support purple rights, she said, you know, it's, <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not what they care about. It's like delegate votes. So Chisholm 72 on Bought and Unbossed. If you haven't seen it, go out and you can Whoa. on, I think, iTunes, yeah. the library. It. It's it's around. <laughs> um, and considering the importance of voting and the importance of participating in um, politics by at least voting, if not running, um, it, it will inspire you. Um, I've also made a film about Angela Davis, the, the yeah. philosopher and activist. And I run <laughs> the film and audio archive at the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. Woo I'm the curator Woo there in that division. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, Candace, I was re resonating with what you were saying about archives. Mm. So, you know, archives is how we, well, Arturo Schomburg called his collection of 10,000 items. Um, it was 10,000 items by the time it was 1925, and the library buys the collection in 1926. And he's mm. collecting at a time when people don't think black history exists. So he mm. writes in this essay, The Negro Digs Up His Past, and mm. names those items, right? At, and you can Google it, The Negro Digs Up yes. His Past, look them up. And he names those items as vindicating evidences. And I'm mm. like, I just thought that was so profound. He was not gonna argue with you over the worth of uh, whether black history existed or not. He was just gonna collect the evidences. And the Schomburg Center is like, we say it's 11 million, but I think it's closer to 13 million vindicating evidences of black Ooh. history and culture from across the diaspora. So it's, and when you hear somebody's voice, right? And when you see a piece of footage and you see how they move, and then you read their words, they become real. Mm -hmm. And it, it, Black history is about reclaiming our legacy, our stories, because we've been there and we've been fighting the good fight yeah. <laughs> from the yeah. very beginning. Yeah. Uh, from the very beginning. Absolutely. Woo! Yay! Uh, <laughs> how exciting. Uh, so actually, let's get into our topic of, of conversation today, which is Shirley and Chisholm. Um, and I wanted to actually share a quote uh, from a speech of hers at Howard University that she did in 1969. Uh, and then we'll just talk a little bit about our ideas around um, Shirley <laughs> and what she did and, and why we are collectively drawn to her bid for the presidency and her assertion of her citizenship. And yeah, so we'll get into that. But the quote goes like this. She says, while nothing is easy for the black man in America, neither is anything impossible. Like old man river, we are moving along and we will continue to move resolutely until our goal of unequivo unequivocal equality is attained. We must not be docile, we must not be resigned, nor must we be inwardly bitter. We must see ourselves in an entirely new perspective and we cannot sit in our homes waiting for someone to reach out and do things for us. Every tomorrow has two handles. We can take hold of the handle of anxiety or the handle of faith. And the first battle is won, my brothers and sisters, when we fight for belief in ourselves and found that it has come to us while we are still battling. So that's a, a quote I wanted to start us off with. We actually had a moment earlier in the in the broadcast where we were talking. Oh, Alexa, stop! <laughs> Alexa's like, yes, yes, I'm, more Chisholm quotes. <laughs> like, <laughs> like this might help you with your conversation. <laughs> Let me give you context. I, I, you raise the frequency with that, though. <laughs> yes, yeah, you picked up on it. <laughs> I mean, we talked earlier about, you know, this handle of anxiety and processing. We asked um, asked our viewers to give some responses in the chat about it processing anxiety around voting. One of our commissions done by Dane Figueroa Ididi is, is her piece is centered on processing anxiety around voting. So I, I feel like this is a quote that she's really getting at, you know, 
this sense of agency, this sense of you determining what you're going to do and that these things are both present always and, and, and making your own choice. So to start us off, uh, Charlotte, can you, what, can you frame for us, what do you think Shirley meant when she said to be unbought and unbossed? What was she, was she referring to the delegate kind of machinations or just, uh, was it a, you know, what do you think? What do, what do you think that was a uh, phrase meant? Yeah, um, I, I think what she meant, well, it was her motto for her campaign when she ran for Congress in 1968 and yeah. became elected the first black woman to Congress, right? Because yeah. of the civil rights laws in the 60s. So it was a, it was a campaign slogan, but I also think it was because it was the way she lived her life hmm. that, you know, it's sometimes taken as something that is angry or strident. And she wasn't that way, even though many of the clips have her being, you know, um, right. school marmy more than like black power, but you know, yeah. school marmy. <laughs> um, but she was quietly persistent in working towards her goals of equality. And what is kind of amazing is in, in the sixties, you know, women were not equal. <laughs> mm. You couldn't get a credit mm -hmm. card in your own name, right? Let mm -hmm. alone open a bank account, let alone whatever. Mm. And here she is like, I'm gonna run for Congress and she wins, nobody thought she would. And in 1972, she's like, I'm gonna run for president. <laughs> full stop. And yeah, people were like, what? <laughs> no, she's like, yeah, full stop. Cause I can do it. <laughs> You know what I mean? Right. It wasn't a joke to her. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's that ability to, um, you know, be true to your, I don't know, destiny, your vision, without mm. letting all the weight of the naysayers mm. and the, <laughs> the negativity mm. crush you. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, in some ways it relates back to the earlier part of the conversation. And I think one of the ways in which she did it is through love. Like she had her core group of people and she had her husband and she had, they were her, you know, safe spaces. They could tell mm -hmm. her the truth and she could cry, I guess, if she needed to or be herself. And then that would build up her Teflon, right? Mm -hmm. to the world. And I think sometimes, especially as women of color, we can take on the, I'm, I'm so tough, it doesn't bother me. I'm so tough. Yes, and yes. it's exhausting to do that. Um, and, and so somehow to remember that we, yes, we deserve love and we deserve mm -hmm. partnership in our work. We deserve partnership at home and wholeness in that way. Um, and I think that's mm. the secret that so many people who've achieved a lot have. They have, yeah. Mm. Wow. I mean, I'm just thinking like, how can I apply this to my life? <laughs> like, <laughs> hmm, like really thinking structurally how to do this. Candace, are, are, are you, I feel like you have a thought. Are you? I do. So okay. I, you know, I, all my work, I, I am always pursuing the underlying history around even a song idea that is, I you know, my idea. I am always curious about what I already knew before it presented itself as an idea that relates to it, so that I hmm. have a, a sense of, I guess, a sense of context for myself. And I was spending time with Shirley Chisholm as I was making this piece and discovered some. Um, uh, archival footage of her at home playing the piano mm. and uh, other footage of her reading her own poetry. Um, and so, Cause I think on some level, Chelsea, I was asking the same question, like how mm. did she nourish herself in a world that was like clearly structurally, you know, pushing against her in many ways and how did she envision the, you know, the very hefty and significant things that she was about to do? Like, mm. and she, and uh, I think watching that just kind of really made sense to me. 
Mm, yeah. okay. That it's it's like uh it's the 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 second part of what you said after the handles and the quote about as you're doing it you'll find the courage that you need. What was the what was it that you said there? Do you mind? She says, yeah, yeah no no no. I do not mind writing it back. Uh, uh, oh, she says, every tomorrow has two handles. We can take hold of the handle of anxiety or the handle of faith. And the first battle is won, my brothers and sisters, when we fight for belief in ourselves belief and find ourselves. that it has come to us while we are still battling. When you're, well, I feel like when you're writing poetry and when you're playing music and you're making music, that is the process is it is mm. coming the belief in yourself is coming to you uh one you, once you're in course yeah yeah and I think in the, that in the midst. Sense of, of uh innate belief in yourself is like the first step and then the rest is a flow out of that yeah yes i mean so i think I, anything that connects you to that flow it could be cooking swimming writing poetry playing percussion, any of those things could be the thing for you. That's what I think, Chelsea. Right, I mean, because if we're agents, if we are agents with autonomy, with with the ability to assert ourselves, then we have to keep the flow of energy to do that open. So I love this, this image of like keeping that flow open so that we're able to just translate what needs to be done efficiently, confidently, and resolutely, which is something that you know, watching Shirley in the documentary, Shala, I just could feel like a steel rod of like knowing and feeling secure in that knowing that I was like, oh, that's so refreshing to see her stand there and just claim space. You know what I mean? Just, I can't say it enough, asserting her her citizenship and, yeah. and throwing her, so, who. I, don't, I forget who's the news host who said, you know, throwing her, her bonnet into the ring, you know? <laughs> right, that was Walter Cronkite. That was Walter Cronkite. That was Walter Cronkite, you know? And I just, it, which is a funny line if you know who Chisholm is, right? And I right. Just, one of the battles over even making that film was with some of the funders and how mm. to start the film. Like, do people know about her? Who, who is she? Is she relevant? Because mm. that film came out in, in 2004. So I was thinking about it at the turn of the century. Wow, yeah. <laughs> and it was before we could even imagine a black person as president. Right, like that was like some alien science fiction stuff. Afro right? that was, that's gonna happen in our lifetime. And so I remember there was a series of executives who said, you know, you need to just take the whole opening sequence out and start with Walter Cronkite. And mm. he says, a hat, no, a bonnet was tossed into the presidential ring today, that of Mrs. Shirley Chisholm, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm. And I thought to myself, this is my first film. These are executives. They have all the power. But if this is the only way to tell stories, I'm not doing it. It mm. took me a moment, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're going to tell a story about somebody who dares to assert their complete citizenship rights and run for mm -hmm. president and think they can be as a Black woman, the leader of the free world, right? Mm -hmm. And I start it with a white guy making fun of her. Yeah. <laughs> like, what does that say? The frame. It's not a yeah. joke. It's not a joke, right? Yeah. And so that would that became a, you know, so, so I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that it was like in, in white culture, mainstream culture, the, the reaction of wanting to laugh their way through discomfort mm -hmm. is, uh, it's a norm in this. It's very American. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, I was actually part of my, the research that I was doing to um, this year has been also for myself and my under, sense of understanding is like some of the, um, the, the racist cartoons that mm -hmm. were used to suppress the black vote and mm -hmm. to just message that we're uh, not worthy of, of our vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, that it, there's a like a impulse, a racist impulse that's a mm -hmm. part of white supremacy to try to su suppress our legitimacy um, through making fun of it. I, I, I would have had the same reaction, Shala. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Like, yeah. but you also you you bring up a really important point about voting that I think Shirley Chisholm also understood. So one of the reason that she wins her congressional race, um, and nobody believes she can, is she actually studied who was voting and they were all women like her. This is a photograph of her with in her cat glasses and her pill hat, a pillbox hat and you know yeah. she's standing with all these other women and they're they're dressed exactly the same way. They worked really hard during the week and that was like the Sunday, you know, outfits or whatever. Um, and so she was running against James Farmer, who was a civil rights activist, well known as part of part of CORE, um, and you know the guys of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And the New York Times was like, "Surely, what? Who? I'm not even going to write about this." There weren't any journalists that followed because they couldn't even imagine that she would win. And she mm -hmm. went about her business of having coffees. Well, mm -hmm. James was out there like with dashiki guys and dashikis and on tom toms and like mm -hmm. vote for vote. and then she won and it was a surprise to everybody except her team who was yeah. like well we knew we were looking at the voters the people who were registered to vote yeah, right <laughs> districts right so oh. it was she used in that sense of her uh, the invisibility that comes with um being um Mm -hmm. Black and a woman, and asserting like it's it, you're either completely ignored or you're somehow offending somebody by exercising your rights. Like, <laughs> and I love that she just exploits that blind spot and just goes really efficiently towards her goal. And it's like I'm totally aware that you underestimate me, and I'm going to use that actually. Yeah, I think when people talk about the power of the white gaze, that's mm -hmm. understanding that and having a sense of that and how pervasive it is, is what can empower you to be adept in using your vote and adept in uh, making your art. And I think, you know, Shala, I don't know if you caught this, but I, um, I just put out a song called Zora's Moon. And in it, I was telling Chelsea, the, the first like 40 seconds is a sample of Zora Neale Hurston, archival sample. Um, at the top of the song, you know, and then and then it spins out from that. And I got pushback on that as well mm. um, from colleagues like, you know, more label centric people about the audacity of putting an archival uh, message, you know, mm. or impression at the top instead of like hooking people with a, a something um, gimmicky, I guess. Mm -hmm. but for me, what I I engage people directly with the truth of it and the uh, intensity of the vulnerability and the um, timelessness of it, mm -hmm. of the sound of her voice mm -hmm. and the joy in it. And I think that's the, I think there are different uh, ways to appeal with your art. And they were suggesting some one hook that is maybe commercial or gimmick oriented and you were, well, I don't want to speak for you, but what I feel in your work and I hope to push in mine is operating on a deeper level uh, of um, just connecting across generations. Mm -hmm. I think what, Ms., what Representative Chisholm said about, um, you know, finding your, what did she say? I wrote it down, self, Self, I guess self-confidence or sense of self mm -hmm. in, the, in the action. Mm -hmm. I think when your action is also informed by where you come from, which for her it was as well, I've heard her speak. So even though, as you said, Shala, like we were missing a lot of our own histories, but she, she knew, uh, I mean, education was very big in her family and her parents came from Barbados mm -hmm. and so I think there was a sensibility of how her civic participation, civic participation was earned. Yeah. And sure. I think that also fascinated me about Hurston. When I work in Hurston, I'm always thinking about how Eatonville, Florida was this utopic society mm -hmm. that was black led and incorporated one of the, I think the first incorporated black town in the United States. Mm -hmm. and what it's like to grow up and see. And I think it's an experience that Chisholm had as well, 
um, in an Afro-Caribbean setting to have a lot of leadership that it, are people of color, black people, I should say, um, you know, teaching you and, and, and shaping you. And I think that's like a special privilege as well when you're talking about uh, other folks of her generation who grew up in segregated schools and uh, amidst the Jim Crow mm -hmm. regime. So I think those those things of what you see at an early age also inform, but I, I'm now I'm straight, I've, I'm off from where I was saying, but I think I felt the same, I got the same kind of resistance in my work mm -hmm. about calling upon archives. And that's why I liked this commission very much because it's at the very center of it. There was no, I didn't have to reverse my car into the spot. You know, mm. to get we, we centered mm. it. <laughs> Love it. So let's, um, thinking about to connecting the past to the present, um, Shirley described herself as issue driven. And so something I'm, I'm curious about from, to hear from both of you is what do you think, you know, if there, if if there were one issue that you think was most urgent or multiple issues that you think are most urgent to be addressed this election cycle, uh, what do you what what are those things? What's at the forefront of, of, of your mind right now going into this season or, or being in this season as we're thinking about, you know, who who to vote for and how to deal with the outcomes of that and dealing with society leading up to that. So what are the issues? Oh, um, that, yeah, that 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 <laughs> that's is, that is that's too big a, a question. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, it more than ever, it's about justice mm -hmm. and the um, use of your vote to support the people who are going to take our tax dollars and apply mm -hmm. them in ways that make justice a reality. I mean, mm. that's the thing about politics is it's not just like an exercise. It's not a popularity contest. It's actually, we are, and especially on, on our, in terms of our local elections, but also the presidency, we're mm -hmm. electing people who represent us and who are gonna take our tax dollars and decide how to use them and create laws for which we all live by. Mm -hmm. If we think about it that way, it's so deep, and we just don't vote, or we give it away, or we, you know, we say it doesn't matter, and it does. And the establishment wants it us not to vote, mm -hmm. right? Which is why voter turnout is so low. I mean, except for Black women, fifty-five percent is really high. Mm -hmm. it's, and you know, and and it's probably because. It, it, it's this, our story is people keep telling us we can't vote. 15th Amendment happens. Oh, black men can vote. And then those those are rolled back with black codes and poll taxes, et cetera. 19th mm -hmm. Amendment, women can vote. Oh, yeah, just white women. Sorry, late, black right. ladies, women of color. And so right. we're still working. We're still pushing. We're still fighting. We were there, you know, club ladies and through the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. the civil rights movement, we undergird it. <laughs> Right. Financially, and, I mean, uh, yes, absolutely. absolutely. In terms of our intellect, in terms of mm -hmm. our finances, in terms of our strategy, in terms of our bodies, right, mm -hmm. and work. Um, and so we don't get to vote until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. <laughs> mm. Think about that. Mm. Ugh. It's profound. Um, and, you know, so we take that responsibility very, very seriously. And, mm. you know, and then there's other societal things that keep, you know, Black men from voting um, mm -hmm. sometimes. But, you know. Yeah, justice. I justice. feel like, and I often think, you know, if you got, you, ha you got to have the consent of the governed. And when there is, su we're at such a tipping point where it's like, if you're not going to respect any of the laws that you apply to us, do we still have to give you the consent to govern us? And my concern is to, to, to continue to chip away at the justice that people feel they, they deserve, to not give them that or to, to not make any effort towards doing that, it's a really destabilizing force. So I think just getting justice is such a huge part of how we're going to repair heal move it forward candace what do you think issues facing us i would say 
my ants are the most like imperative agenda for this election is social justice. I would say mm -hmm. it in the same way. Mm -hmm. I think um, the industrial prison complex and the privatization of prisons has to be abolished. Um, there needs to be uh, social justice in the area of, of climate change and which communities are disaffected time and again. Um, you know, as we look at Flint and we look at so many so many communities, Flint is just it, it's a just a super clear example mm -hmm. of how our community has been, you know, just just sort of terrorized by by an environmental issues that that make our children so vulnerable. Um, educational justice needs to be uh, a, a priority. Um, clearly, I think that we should be mindful of the courts. I've from what I read, yes, it's an understatement. Um, but I think that in the last election, that was less of a conversation and less of an agenda uh, on the progressive, you know, among the progressives. And it's something that the Republican Party is always good at mobilizing their vote around. Um, so a consciousness of of um, how the judiciary, you know, plays into the the rights we're able to. Uh, to enjoy, but I, I think that for me, what I'm the lesson that I'm learning is that all elections are local. And um, when I look back and I was reflecting on this night where we get to talk about the history of the black woman's vote, I was thinking so much and I've been spending time with um, a book called To Joy My Freedom by Tara Hunter. Mm. It's one of the formative books on critical race theory and black studies that I I received in college and it's like well worn and dog eared for me mm. where Hunter talks about the washerwomen and the washerwomen movement um black women who organized and sort of created the paradigm that was taken up by the fe the white feminist movement of organizing and um certainly like we've said, like was part of the underpinning of the civil rights movement. I heard Chisholm say that uh, in another interview that she was the ghost writer of the civil rights movement. Um, so I think about the writer and I think about the ghost part. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, representation and visibility and all those things are local issues. How can we feel visible? How can we feel heard? How can we feel like we're participating in the process? And not feel like it's so abstract and above us and beyond, you know, our sense of efficacy as as individuals. Well, keep it local. Work in your community um, to do what you can do within your reach and your circle of influence. And I think no matter what our, you know, role is, you don't have to be an elected official to have um, a circle of influence and to act and show up where you say, you know. You need to be, and uh, that's that's why I always. That's what I'm thinking right now. I, I just feel like I'm doing everything that I can do in my circle of influence. I can't change what happened, you know, the other night on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can mm -hmm. do do what I can do. Yeah. So I think if everyone can can feel that way about this vote, we can get somewhere. And no matter what happens in this election, I think we recommit to organizing the way we, we have and in new ways that we, we are still imagining. And yeah, oh, Shala, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, was, I, I was just thinking, you know, um, one of the silver linings, I mean, th there, about our, the COVID-19 situation is that it slowed all of us down Mm -hmm. um, and we have to think about the things that are important. Um, and so much of life had been spent like rushing around and getting to events and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the work that um, Chisholm did and that you're referring to Candace and Chelsea, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the organizing the work is not fabulous. It's, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's roll your sleeves up, mm -hmm. <laughs> pull a chair up, Sit mm -hmm. there and it's committing and it's committing to yourself um, and it's committing to your community and by that committing committing to the future um, and 
you know, we have to kind of think about it and remember that not everything has to be so fabulous, right? To get where we we need to go. That sometimes it's, it, it it is it, work doesn't mean there can't be pleasure, right? Yeah, right. That. <laughs> we got to slow it down and be time for it. Um, and it's not something you can just you know put off, right? I agree with you. I think that when we talk about this this election, it has to be, it has to be how you live your life, right? Yeah, it has to be a practice. Yes like yeah. being a musician, like being an athlete, like, you know, mm -hmm. our activism can't just be voting every four years, right? It yes. is, what is your practice? How does, yeah. how do you, how do you honor it daily, weekly, et cetera? Yeah, mm -hmm. Chelsea was, when we first got on, she said, how are you dealing with anxiety and how do you view it in this moment? And I know she asked you a similar question. And I think like, the, the being very candid and asking a question like that is just always mm -hmm. the right place to start. Mm -hmm. um, candor and vulnerability are underlying parts of this. And, you know, we've been as a, as a community, we've been traumatized in so many ways. There has to be expansive spaces like this where art and activism can meet, where personal witnessing. I mean, you, the three of us have read and all of us here um, in conversation tonight, everyone who's watching, we've read so many incredibly powerful testimonies of um, by, by black writers, filmmakers, um, songwriters, dancers, you know, uh, uh, speaking to their own experience and the structural um, you know the structural circumstances that that, right. that shape our reality. Um, that requires a, a degree of vulnerability, a slowing down, and connecting mm. to how things sit with you um, mm. to be able to find the language to say it and to be able to disavow any lies or 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 you know mistruths being told about you while you're trying to do what you need to do. Mm. And um, I think we feel with this pandemic, like I said before, a sense of confinement and a sense of um, pressure. Um, and we can tap into the other aspects of it. And and uh, I think that's, yeah, I think that's, that's a big part of this election for me too. It's like, how will this, knowing that I'm committed, no matter what a like result is. Yeah, and I mean, this is such a beautiful segue into you know, thinking about commitment, thinking about an embodied practice, an everyday practice, um, and also the legacy of Black women's uh, activism. NBT has partnered with Michelle Obama's When We All Vote, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization of which this conversation series is, you know, we're, we're really trying to get the word out about what people can do to really embody this practice of getting on the Chisholm Trail and asserting mm -hmm. that citizenship, you know? really, really reckoning with with stepping into the public square and letting it be known what has to happen. Um, and so what I'm gonna be doing every time we have one of these live conversations, of which there are two more, um, we're gonna have a voter to do. And today's voter to do is register to vote. And when we all vote has um, a link there that, that takes you to a place where you can e easily register to vote. So assert that citizenship, y'all. Um, and this is not just every four years. This is something that you can be doing for those of us in the community who can't. Um, and this is something that can be made into a practice. So voter to do, register to vote. That's going to be step one for tonight. Uh, oh, yes. And we've got it dropped into the chat there for you to click and make that as easy as possible. Um, we are coming to the end of our time together. Um, and this has just been such a um, really fruitful, generative conversation, a really great kickoff to the unbought and unbossed <laughs> conversation series to really be unpacking this legacy. Um, and I have another quote that I would like to share of Shirley's to close us out. And I would love to get you all's reaction to this. And I, I probably have some closing messages I need to Did do. Did they ask some, any questions? Anybody ask any Oh, do we have any? Do Let's see, let's see. What do we, what do we've got going in the comments? 
And, 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 you know, don't forget um, that Chisholm wrote two books um, on bought and unbossed and the good fight. Um, And so it's never bad to go back to the, to the the source. Yes, for to learn something uh, about her life, and then of course um, Chisholm seventy two on Bot and on Boss, the documentary. You can always um, watch that. Check it out. Um, okay, so let me find this quote that I wanted to share a bit here. And actually, uh, while you're doing that, I will. You yeah. know, one of the pleasures of working at an archive is you find all of these discoveries that are not processed or unearthed. And hmm. a little over a year ago, we discovered that we had audio of Shirley Chisholm on the campaign trail in 1968. Nobody else has this. What? And her victory speech, you know, in the room. And somebody thought, okay, I have my cassette recorder. I'm going to record this and did. And it's, it, it's, inc- it's, it's incredible. Um, there's nothing like listening to somebody's voice, right, as they're in the moment um, of a victory that. or in the fight. Yeah, so. I love that. It and reminds me of again, y'all have to come by the the, the movie <laughs> image and report sound division. Please Check stop out. By. There are so <laughs> many gems. So many gems. I mean, yes. so much vindicating evidences. I can't. I can't. Can't oh, describe. Chelsea, I can't yes. describe. <laughs> I, I know. I, 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 like, I love, I think that one of the things that's special for me about being an artist right now is that I can avail myself of digital histories. And I feel like it's something that was hard. One, not just the, the stories and the victories, but the fact that we have it, the access to this information and history at our fingertips. And I just want to thank you at uh, National Black Theater for engaging us as artists and creating a space for us to make um, stand up and be counted. Mm -hmm. And it just meant so much to us in this moment to have uh, a lot, what just to let you all in into the process, National Black Theater commissioned us artists to make a piece of our own design inspired by Unbought and Unbossed and the legacy of Shirley Chisholm and just we worked collaboratively to create these video presentations. I hope you will follow National Black Theater on Instagram and view our pieces. Um, my piece with Val Jean T, um, Stand Up and Be Counted, was released yesterday. So please yeah, check that out and share questions and thoughts and reactions because we're, we're here for this communal conversation, this sister circle. So please. <laughs> drop a comment on that check it out or share it i want to thank when we all vote as well for um being a sponsor and support of our vision and like joining with us to empower the the community to vote and if you would like to follow me and listen to zora's moon you can find that new single on all the streaming platforms if you love zora if you don't know zora and want to meet her um through me you can check that out wherever you listen to music. Ah, beautiful. That's a beautiful closing. I mean, that, that should be actually the closing of this whole thing. But um, I'm going to share this quote with you from Shirley Chisholm. This is from the same speech at Howard University, 1969. She says, we must not allow petty things to color our lives and stimulate them into vast proportions of evil. To dwell on every slight and clutch it to our breast and nourish it will corrode our thinking. We're on the move now. And as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a struggle. It never has and it never will. So I think that is a great place for us to kind of put a bow on our conversation about asserting your citizenship, remaining unbought and unbossed in your life. Um, and just the perspective that we are going to move through this this season with the joy and love, respect for ourselves, and, and and constantly an embodied practice of building community and being engaged citizens, because we got it like that, and it's our job. Um, I'm so so grateful to you, Candice, and to you, Shala, for joining me this evening and for joining MBT in this process. Shala, you actually did um, a commission for the 100 Years 100 Women project. Yes. 
And um, I just really want to shout that out because it was such a beautiful, um, how would yes. you describe? Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, sure. You know, um, I first of all, I was very honored to be um, one of the hundred artists commissioned to kind of grapple with what that night, that, that anniversary meant um, mm -hmm. as a black woman. Mm. And as I was thinking about it, COVID happened. And so, you know, a filmmaker always wants to go out and do interviews and run around and collect images and we couldn't, right? Mm. So I changed it so that we, I, I said, I wanna do the piece that reflects this moment and all hundred artists. So I asked every one of the artists to um, uh, send me a video. I asked a series of questions. I did, uh, you know, I directed via video. <laughs> What? <laughs> and it was either in groups, like Zoom calls, et cetera. And also to share something about their process of creating that work and what they were thinking of and reflecting on in this moment. And all of that, I mashed it up into 100 Years, 100 Women. And hopefully what the piece does is it reflects not only um, the 19th Amendment, the anniversary and the complicated nature of that and the kind of rewriting of that moment we need to do to include women of color, but also mm -hmm. the all hundred beautiful artists and what they were thinking about and reflecting on. And it was everything from dancers to musicians to poets to, oh. uh, you know, uh, oh, nice. to paint to photographers and it was real such a such a pleasure such such a pleasure so yeah, yeah. And uh, got the link right. down what there for you the link i was gonna say and it's only seven <laughs> minutes long vogue even did a nice write-up of the whole project and included oh. the link of that piece um it's and so gorgeous. I was always thinking about what it would be like in the, in another hundred years. So when yes. 200 women are reflecting on the 200th Ooh. anniversary. And so we created the archive, and the film, and I the archive that was collected from all the artists to make the film. Oh, I love, we gotta build the archive. We got yeah. to, we got to have the vindicating evidences of our existence because <laughs> we, we've been yeah. here. We, yes. this is, we've got the receipts for this. You know what I mean? Um, let's not look away from the truth of what this is. So I am so proud to stand in community with y'all as we, as we do this, as we do this. We're my in the centennial. Next, my next yeah. move is a video for Zora's Moon, which is coming out in another few weeks too. So I, I agree you, with you. you. I think the that the, the, is working, working, the visual working. archive, the living archive and just being yes. living monuments is critical. That's yes. so cool. I mean, I love that your whole community just rang out like a <laughs> constellation. So that that piece Absolutely. is up on on NBT website. You yes. said, yep, yep. Yeah, I gotta check that mm -hmm. out. Check it out. It's it is. I mean, you feel the power of a hundred years, one hundred women. You feel like we are coming into this into this century with like rolling really deep like we've got so much ancestral backing us up it's not even funny and your piece Charlotte just really encapsulated that hour so <laughs> a portrait of again a portrait of the moment in in a big way and in a little way right I the mean, details it's, it's practical exactly yes it's the exactly. microcosm yeah, of all the of macro. the pieces woven together you know it's it's like a, it's like a good quilt <laughs> yes. Good yes the visual story is so important yeah, just manifesting absolutely. it into something something that can that can uh, just kind of live independently of you like that is so powerful. Absolutely. That's really cool. yeah. We are making the archive as we live it, y'all. And I'm so honored to be doing it with 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 y'all. Thank you for joining me this evening. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, check out our website. Share, 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 share the wonderful um, commissions that these artists are creating to talk about what's happening now, what's happening with us and how we're visioning our future forward. I am Chelsea D. I am signing out for this evening, sending you much love, much love, much love. Thank you to Shala. Thank, thank you to you. Candace. Thank you thank to you Mia. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Love, love to you all. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>